Good morning. A little bit late. We've worked out the technical difficulties, but I think you're watching this live on my personal channel. So I'm going to be working in a little bit uh, to move it to the Bella Vista platform. We are very excited to have forged ahead. And here we are with Dr. Allison Motri from the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine. Um, it is an absolute honor to have you join us today. Uh, yeah, I miss these conversations. How come? I mean, I, know, I miss, I miss those you. interactions. I miss seeing you. I miss connections. I miss your smiling face and everyone in your lab that comes in every day for coffee, for tea, for conversation. And um, it's amazing how we miss those things, right? I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it's every day, but once you don't have it, now you notice how important they are. Absolutely. So I have with me my co host. Uh, this is Alexis Dixon from Mediation <laughs> Solutions International and Steve Chappell from Intellectual Capital. So they're here to just help round out the conversation. And, um, you know, I, I, I need help understanding all this information, but a lot of people are saying you were amazing at being able to take these big ideas and concepts and um, what, I, what I say, a schoolhouse rocket for us non-science speakers. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to Steve and let him kind of start the introduction with you, Allison. And I'll be moving this onto the Bell Vista platform. Perfect. Como vai? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, of course, it's very interesting, I think, how you made it from Brazil to the Sanford Consortium. But really, let's cut to the chase, because your work is so important with uh, organelles, with uh, neurons, with, uh, with streaming pluripotent uh, stem cells, what all that means for moms, dads who might have kids with uh, what we call mental issues or how these are defined. You, you know, you have a a very grounded idea about autism, about the what we call the schizophrenia, um, all of that. So maybe just launch ahead because you're at the forefront of medicine. It's exciting. Yeah. So uh, I I think I mean I I I've been interested on, on autism and how the human brain functions for a long time. And when you study what's unique about the human brain, you realize that the social aspects, uh, the way we talk and see each other is really important and has been really important for evolution to put us where we are. That's why a virus can take advantage of that and, and just spread out. Um, <laughs> but, but my point is what happens when the human brain fails to connect to each other? So then we have mutants where the brain doesn't really function in a social way. And uh, some of those are mutations in genes that are related to autism, for example, where they have impaired on, on social interactions and language, things that, um, that, that we do every day. And I was like very interested on that for a long time. Um, and, and, and the data uh, from multiple labs have shown that um, this always starts in uterus. It's all about how your brain is formed to shape uh, how- in vitro, As a fetus, yeah. As a Sorry. fetus, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and that, those like early interactions or, or networks that, that are being like shaping when you are a fetus, an embryo, a fetus, and a newborn, kind of shapes who you are. It's not deterministic, but has a huge impact on who you are. And, uh, and the, the, the problem for science, it is we don't have access to the in uterus human brain. So we have to rely on animal models or, or other models that are not so relevant. So for a long time, we didn't have any, any way to study how the human brain is formed. So that's when I turned into stem cells. And that's what brought me to California from Brazil as an explant uh, from Brazil to take advantage of uh, pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that are similar to the embryonic cells and learn how to drive them to become neuro tissue. So that's what we do in the lab. We take, uh, we reprogram cells from people. This can be you and me. Um, we push the cells back to these pluripotent states. It usually starts with a skin cell or blood or even dental pulp. Um, once the cells are in that stage, we drive them to become neuro tissues. And, and we are getting so good at that, that they become uh, structures that self-assemble in 3D and forms what some, some people call a mini brain, 
um, because it's a miniaturized version of the tissue, the correct term would be a brain organoid. Um, these are real, these are, this is real human tissue. That's this correct. Yeah, these are real human tissues. And they, they show at the molecular level that they are very similar to the, uh, to, to, uh, to the tissue that we have in, in, in the brain. We know that uh, from uh, post-mortem tissues or, or, or fetal tissues that, that we study, we know that they are very similar. And in, in, in last year, we showed that not only uh, they can arrange anatomically and resemble uh, the structure that we see in the brain, but they start functioning and form networks that resemble these early stages of, of network. Now I'm sure people ask: Are they is that are they alive? I mean, is that a type of uh, of explain? Uh, that's a phenomenon, right? I mean, it's I don't want to compare us to slime molds or something, but it's, it's they're actually grouping together in a in an organized way. Is that programmed? And go on about that a little bit. The implications, and I saw you actually have a working sort of robot that moves slowly but carefully based mm -hmm. on the actual um, neuronic engagements, all the neurons yeah. coming together. And Yeah, so this, I mean, yeah, I mean, starting from your first question, they are, they are alive. Uh, those neurons are firing, there is spontaneous firing, action potential, they are communicating with each other, they are forming connections, they are forming synapses. The synapses, as the neurons mature, uh, they become more and more uh, 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 connected or strong, and uh, these networks start to communicate and, and, and signalize through the structure, um, generating what we call brain waves. These brain waves are similar to the signal that you can record from the human brain by, by placing uh, an EEG or electrodes to, to your skull. And, um, and, and we see that they evolve. I mean, we can keep them for several years in the lab and they evolve. They become very mature in the beginning uh, and then slowly increasing complexity, reaching to a level where you can clearly see the emergency of these brain waves uh, without any stimulation. I mean, we are not doing anything. This is all genetically programmed. Can I ask a, a very naive question? So what is a brain wave? Is it... Uh sound or uh, light yeah. or electromagnetic? A brain wave is the combination of uh, several spontaneous activity of neurons uh, that fire in synchrony. And they become firing synchrony, suggesting that they are talking to each other. And in the beginning, this is very rigid. It's one neuron, talk to another neuron, who talks to another neuron. Uh, and as those neurons mature, uh, their dendrites or their process become more arborized and uh, they form more and more connections. So the um, uh, uh, more and more inputs are coming and these networks become more complex. So when you look at a higher perspective, what you see is just some kind of a communication going on. You don't fully understand each one or how they do it, but you can see that they are organized uh, in, in some way. So that's very important for us because we never knew how the brain organized itself. And now we at least have a model to start asking those questions. And as I understand it, that's so important to understand what could have gone wrong in utero or what is going wrong maybe with brain trauma. Um, so you can compare perhaps for the first time in human history, um, things that are going wrong and things that seem to be the way they should be. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's it. I mean, the, uh, the model has like several uh, uses now. One is to see what goes wrong on someone with autism or schizophrenia or a brain trauma, you, you can create those models and compare to, to a, a normal condition or a control condition. Uh, you can test uh, environmental inputs, uh, for example. What's the mm -hmm. impact of uh, a viral infection in the developing mm -hmm. brain? So you, you, you can test those ideas, but perhaps even more importantly from, from the therapeutic side, um, you can use this model to uh, block a potential damaging factor. So you can test the drugs that might uh, inhibit or protect the brain against some specific injuries. So you can think about perhaps healing the brain. Is that uh, too much to say? Or we can begin to think about what that might be. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, there are several uh, diseases that we work in the lab. 
where we clearly see alterations in these uh, miniaturized uh, brains. And um, by uh, testing some therapeutic opportunities, even pharmacological treatment, we, we can see uh, the potential for reversibility. So we can, we can see, we can create a network uh, of autistic neurons, for example, and they wow. do not fire like the controls or neurotypicals, but upon the stimulation, we can make them behave exactly as the control, the healthy group. So it, it shows that there is potential for reversibility. So it, it's almost like this idea that once the brain is, is fully wired, there is nothing mm -hmm. to do once the damage mm -hmm. is done. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's BS. We are changing neurosciences because now we have this ability to show for the first time that those things are reversible. So what you're speaking to is an astonishing plasticity of the cell. Yeah, yeah, way more than we ever thought. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so by that, the way, <laughs> you can say BS on this show. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mom. We're among friends. <laughs> Permission granted. <laughs> we're, we're among 50,000 friends at the moment. <laughs> yeah. This sounds like a, like a passion for you, and I'm wondering what led you to this field of work with such passion and such what seems to be singular focus. And yeah. what was the journey that brought you here? In the beginning, it was, was really academic. I was <laughs> really into uh, neurosciences, and, and as I said, the social brain always fascinated me. What makes us so social compared to a chimpanzee, for example? A chimpanzee uh, a colony is no more than 15 individuals. Once they become too large, there is conflict. The youngster needs to leave the colony. And, uh, but we humans, we uh, somehow have this ability to interact with uh, thousands of people in living large cities. And most importantly, we can use that tool to collaborate. And, and that's how we advance sciences and technology. That's why we're having this conversation online in different places, right? I mean, you don't see a chimpanzee thinking about that. So we are kind of unique among the species. So that was my academic interest. Um, fast forward several years, I now have a kid with autism, uh, Ivan. He's like <laughs> And, uh, and I want to help him. I mean, I see that he struggles in life. I mean, he has a severe type of autism. He's nonverbal. Um, he has uh, very strong seizures almost daily. And, um, and it's hard for him to, to do even basic daily activities like uh, comb his hair or eating. Um, so and, and he's not alone. There's so many people with, with autism. So now I have this... Uh, uh, extra motivation to push sciences to a more translational mode so we can we can help those people How that's your own child that's your own child that's uh, he's uh, he's not my biological uh, child uh, yeah. now he's officially my son uh, because he, you know, <laughs> we officialized that but I met my wife through my work actually um, and uh, she she was a mom uh, with an autistic uh, son. Um, and, sure. and I met both of them, and I fell in love, and, and here we are. We, uh, we, we are a family now. It's so funny because I hear so many stories about how autism breaks the family apart. Just and in our situation, it, it brought us together. Well, well, wow, that's an amazing that's story. Amazing. How fast is the research going? And what do you expect to see if the research continues at the pace that is continuing, where do you think we could possibly be, possibly be uh, a decade from now or two decades from now? What's the hope on the horizon that you see that drives you and, and continues, fuels your passion? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, in, uh, for autism, what we are finding is that uh, there are many causes, and that's why it's so heterogeneous. Um, you have uh, different people with autism, and that can be a 40-year-old guy who is just like not uh, very social, and, and, and from a child who is non-verbal and has all difficulties on communicating. Um, so it's very variable. And, and we learn from the genetics that uh, uh, the causes could be different, um, but they converge on, on some similarities. So it, I like the analogy with cancer. Uh, in the past, we knew about cancer. People die from cancer. Now we don't say that anymore. You say they have uh, a specific type of cancer. So with autism, we're going to break the spectrum uh, and, and review the different subtypes. 
So what does it mean uh, in 10 years from now is that we're going to tailor treatments for each subtype. We're going to find uh, better uh, medications, better drugs for each one of them and move into clinical trials so we can help all the subgroups and be very specific. Because right now there is no drugs or, or, or medicine for autism. We're just repurposing from other diseases uh, to, to, to reduce their symptoms. But that's it. I mean, there's uh, nothing... Uh, that acts on the core of autism. Is it really possible to say what autism is? I mean, you talked about kind of a, a spectrum from somebody who might be uh, well-functioning but socially uh, um, separate, and then people who really have trouble with language and, 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 and motion and stuff. Is I mean, humans always like to put a label on things. Do you think it'll break up like cancer and, and in the future we'll see it as a different mutations and, 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 and very different uh, manifestations really of things that are different in the brain from what we call normal or? Uh, yeah, it is, it is happening now. Uh, you can see that uh, as we figure out the biology of specific cases and, and, and we find ways to group them, not only because of the causes, most of the time genetic causes, I mean, when, when we find the gene, it's become, become clear that those cases are very similar, so we cluster them, and most of the time what happens, uh, uh, they become a syndrome, a separated syndrome. So it's uh, XYZ gene syndrome, and this is happening now. So like Asperger's is under the umbrella of, of autism. autism, yeah. Okay. Could you but give some other examples? Few. Can you give other examples of ones that have been identified? Yeah, or yeah. Um, uh, rat syndrome. Uh, rat syndrome was a form of autism in girls. In 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 in, in, in we um, uh, we realized that uh, it is slightly different. I mean, they are still non-verbal. They have like a. Uh, stereotype hand movements, um, developmental delay, but it's still not quite because they are severely affected from the motor side as well. They end up in a wheelchair. And um, we figured out the causes. We know the gene. And over the years, uh, it becomes clear that uh, if you have mutations in that gene, what you have is rat syndrome. It's not autism. So we separate it from the spectrum. And this is happening with other genes as well, fragile X. It's another example. It used to be uh, under the umbrella of autism. Now it's fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome. Yeah. And the same might be said of uh, schizophrenia. That's kind of a grab bag term. Uh, could you maybe elucidate that a little bit? It sort of fascinates me. And I think it's, uh, you know, we've gone from like Plato to the 19th century and, and beyond. It's very mm -hmm. tricky. Yeah, uh, same for schizophrenia. So uh, I think in the future, all these conditions that we call uh, by a name, just because we see some trends here and there, I think they will become subtypes of the condition. Maybe it's going to be schizophrenia type 1, schizophrenia type 2, um, to distinguish all these uh, subtle differences between them. And that will help the medical team in clinical trials to be more specific when they find uh, treatment for these conditions. So this is very big <laughs> news about the potential for healing, for approaches to the syndromes. Um, what else are you working on that's uh, pretty, it's pretty cutting edge stuff? I, I expect Matt Damon to be listening and you know grab a new movie out of it. Where Remember where he's dying into the computer and then he takes over the internet of the <laughs> world? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we are uh, obviously, I mean, looking for the uh, disease condition. It's, it, it's very important, and, and that's the focus of my lab. But we do have some other projects that are more into um, uh, the basic fundamental mechanisms of how the brain works. Mm -hmm. um, one example is a recent collaboration with Microsoft. Um, I think it's official now. Uh, so we are working with them to figure out how the connections in these brain organoids actually work. And the idea is to generate novel algorithms that will learn how the brain works so we can apply to create a new form of artificial intelligence that's more human-like. Um, so maybe in the future, the way artificial intelligence works would be all derived from the organic tissue that we can create in the lab. And, um, and, and that's open a, a gigantic type of opportunities. And, and as we advance 
Uh, one thing that I think is important, we open a very important um, ethical concerns. So we are reframing the ethical <laughs> discussions um, about this uh, methodology. Uh, for example, take artificial intelligence. I mean, of course, I mean, we can create better driverless cars or, or, or better algorithms for our cell phones. But where this technology should not go, it's as important as where this technology should go. I'm very so happy this, that you brought that up, the, yeah. the question of <laughs> no. I was going to ask you that question, and I'm glad you talk about kind of the collaboration with Microsoft, which, is, which has the budget and the vision and the, certainly the technical capacity to do the things you're working on. But in a world of specialization, is there enough cross-pollinization in the, in the labs and in the field of science to really attack this in a more of an ecosystem kind of way? Does that question make sense at all? Because we live in a world where we specialize and where we can become very siloed and very myopic. And given yeah. the broadness of what you're talking about within the field of science, particularly when people can get the Nobel Prize for a particular thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking if I'm going to try to get the Nobel Prize, am I really as concerned about autism as I am the singular focus on what's going to get me that prize? So there are artificial rewards for this kind of siloed singularity and yet, as you speak about it, I'm thinking, what's the scientific cross-pollination that brings all kinds of methodologies to, to the vastness of this, of this you know, endeavor? Yeah, unfortunately, the science is all messed up and it will take a while to, <laughs> to fix it. We, we giving too much emphasis on, on, on single investigators or single ideas that do not cross-pollinize others. And the Nobel Prize, is, it's a huge example of that. Yeah. Usually the Nobel Prize goes uh, for people who really uh, dissect a single mechanism. It might have broader implications, but that's not what uh, the guy has, has shown. Um, mostly the guy, because I mean, <laughs> very few women has we seen. Well, that's where you, that's where you think about uh, Watson and Crick and, and um, um, their crystallographer, um, compatriot who died early and couldn't as a woman who couldn't get it yeah. um, and uh, they were like physicists who became chemists and then jumped into biology and in fact m many of the founders like Schrodinger himself right was uh, it came out of physics and and moved into biology and it's that sort of riptide between different fields sometimes that creates the the novel ideas but and, and, and that's what uh, what used to happen right but but since then, I mean, for several reasons that would take forever for us to discuss, uh, this is not happening now, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's not encouraged to, to happen now. So it's very few people uh, are brave enough to start like broadening broaden this up. Um, and um, but I mean, hopefully, science science will change because we need uh, we are in, in a moment that uh, a single lab, a single investigator cannot do it at all. We need to collaborate. We need to be more open to um, to collaborations, and and to be honest, I think we need to to aim higher. I think we are very conservative in science. We most of um, uh, people just do the the next step because they are looking for the next publication, the next grant, and they are afraid to jump ten steps ahead. Um, and um, so that that's a problem in science. We should be able to kind of shoot high. I think. I would like to, I, I, there's two things I wanted to speak to. The first is I absolutely agree. And we're going to be bringing on the show in May, Brian Keating, who's yeah. actually, I'm sure you know him very well. And he's a neighbor here in La Jolla. And um, he, you know, he has the book. It's sitting up on my shelf. Um, losing the Nobel losing Prize. Losing the Nobel Prize. And it's just yeah. about that. So we got it. We'll, we'll have the two of you come back and do a discussion on just that, on are you focused on the prize? You know, I have a friend, she's a director in now in Hollywood and, and it's she's like, it's not about the prize. She should have won an Oscar. But if, if you're focused on the prize, then then you lose the love of the craft and the bigger right. picture. Right. I think yeah. also, you know, I love that you're having this discussion because you are at the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, which is in fact a collaboratory. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I ended up owning, you know, and then blessed the cafe and built a social club. 
in a collaboratory and people used to come and say, well, what's a collaboratory and who's in the building? And I couldn't even remember the five <laughs> institutes, especially L- LJI, which they changed their name. Yeah. Um, but it, but it is important. And, and I had to learn, okay, what is this collaboratory and what is the idea? And it was amazing to see how the building and the architecture was designed for those collisions and for for connections to happen. And then when I learned of the mission of the building, I was like, okay, yeah, this is gonna be perfect because we wanna build a social network. So it'll be interesting moving forward to see how perhaps with the studies that are going on with the organic structure of the social network that is happening at Bella Vista, can we look at it and see how it grows with artificial intelligence? So I see a lot of collaborations Mm -hmm. happening and um i wanted to jump back to where jump back to where you were um some things that you were worried about i suppose it's uh, the microsoft question whether artificial intelligence could get a little further out there the irobot concept and and then you know autism and maybe that's not your total focus of course but um you know there's so there's some major controversies on how things started. And I wonder if you could maybe frame that in a useful way for many of our listeners. Uh-huh. So, um, so the technology um, really uh, is based on reconstructing the human brain. Um, and there are many investigators who are uh, trying to do the same thing for other tissues, for a heart, for a liver, uh, for a pancreas. Uh, because this is all about regenerative medicine. If we learn how the tissue works and, and regenerates, we can help people, can even replace tissue in the future. But the brain, and nobody, and everybody's okay with that. Uh, right. But the brain <laughs> brings, uh, it puts people in a very uncomfortable situation because well, you, you can have a new liver and that's not a problem. A lot of people exactly. would like one. Maybe yeah. many Bella Vista customers, yeah. but <laughs> back to the, <laughs> but the brain is a little touchier. It is. It is. Brenner's working on the liver, right, Dr. Brenner? Yeah, Brenner is on, on, on liver. Yeah. Oh, we didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Sorry. So, <laughs> and, and, and then, I mean, yeah, if I say that, I oh, can you give me, like, your cells or cells from your family so I can recreate your um, a brain organoid from your genome uh, in my lab? So that would be your avatar. That would be your mini brain sitting in, in my lab. And some people just freak out. They said, "Well, my gosh! So you have like my uh, my mini brain there? I mean, why did you see something?" <laughs> Steve so, Baba Fett Chapel. I Sorry. volunteer. Wait. <laughs> would you? That's. Would you volunteer? Would you guys volunteer? Do you want an avatar? What do you think? <laughs> well, I certainly would. I have a problem with mortality being uh, uh, north of 60 here, you know. They used to say 70 was the new 50, and then the, but the virus didn't agree with that. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, it, what, part of that is affordability. Who can afford it? Who controls it? Who has access to it? I mean, you know, when you talk about the morality of this thing, it's not just the part in and of itself. We've lived in an equitable society. I think people would have less fear, but when you talk about this kind of cutting edge technology, it certainly doesn't, it certainly isn't free, it comes with a cost. And yeah. so then it the begs the question, who can afford it, who controls it, who has access to it? And then what does that mean for those who do not have access to it mm-hmm. and can't afford it? And so if you can actually do something with autism or have me live for 200 years, and that's at a $200,000 cost, you know, who lives and who dies? <laughs> So that, that's the first of all the moral questions that we bring, right? I mean, if you can, I, I wish I could do uh, for all kids with autism, I'll, I'll have their mini brains here so I can understand and find uh, treatments for each one of them. That's what we call personalized medicine. That will become like a, a real thing in the future. And in the beginning, it's going to be a very expensive technology as everything else. But as we move along, I mean, the tendency is always for the technology to become more popular. At least that was uh, the way the world was um, functioning before COVID-19. Now it's a different world and we don't know how it's going to happen. But nonetheless, I'm not going into that discussion. But, um, but yes, so the other uh, ethical concern, uh, apart from cost and accessibility, it is uh, the moral status of the organoid. 
Because some people might believe or, or think, and I, I do agree that this is a real concern, that uh, one day the technology will get to a point where these organoids might reach a state of self-consciousness or self-aware, <laughs> right? Wow. And, and now you have your genome creating another self-conscious entity yeah. apart from your body. Um, so should we treat those organoids as a person? Um, uh, even if they're not fully conscious, the same as we treat a newborn, right? Right. Or only, only if they can walk the dog on command. Or we can use them for something else, yeah. I mean, but then are we creating a bunch of uh, slaves uh, just to work? Uh, do they have feelings? Can they feel pain? Are they suffering inside my incubator? Yeah. So these are questions that uh, people what? are asking oh, me. It's a, big, it's a crazy big question, you know, 100 years from now, 50 years from now. I mean, I think literary people are already jumping into that. But you're, they're basing all their speculation on what you really do. Yeah. yeah. What does your work and the science of your work merge or does it with the CRISPR research? Is CRISPR and your work in harmony or in sync? Is there some co compatibility to share resources? Yeah. yeah. So uh, CRISPR, I mean, for, for those who are not familiar, are these uh, editing, uh, genome editing tools uh, where you can manipulate uh, the genome uh, using those enzymes and and uh, the, there are many enzymes that can do that. The CRISPR is just the more uh, versatile or the easier to use. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we always take advantage of those enzymes to manipulate uh, the genome. Um, my lab uses that all the time to create disease variants on these organoids so we can understand how specific genes affect the development, uh, the neurodevelopment uh, of these organoids. And we have other projects as well. I mean. One question I, I briefly mentioned to you is on this evolutionary process. Uh, how come the humans, uh, the modern humans, my brain, your brain, become so different from other species, even from other humans that existed on Earth? And I'm talking about the Neanderthals. I'm talking about the Neanderthals because these are the ones we have a better fossil records. But the Neanderthals didn't evolve technology as we do, even though their brains are about the same size and volume, but they never uh, accomplished that level of sophistication that we have. So one research in my lab asks the following question. What are the genetic modifications that makes our brains unique compared to the Neanderthals? So we have a, a, a genomic approach. We compare the genome of the Neanderthals that you can extract from bones and, uh, and compare to modern humans. And then we look for the differences. And once we look for the differences, we ask, what if I manipulate using these CRISPRs, I can ancestralize or add the Neanderthal variant in one of these brain organoids and create a brain organoid that carries a Neanderthal variant, a Neandertoid. Can we compare those two? So this is actually going on in the lab. <laughs> Picture if you, this is very um, Rod <laughs> Serling, what was Rod Serling? Twilight Zone. This what? is very Twilight Zone. And doctor, before you leave, um, and what I'd love you to do if possible is to debunk some of the myths about autism that's floating around out there yeah. that is really, in a way, can harm parents um, who have children that are autistic. So some, what are some of the myths that exist that you'd like to say, hey, be careful of this? Yeah, there, there are several. And, and, and this is uh, throughout human history. Whenever you don't know uh, what's the cause, we always find a way to blame something uh, to find the cause. And then, then, I mean, we can put our, our frustrations on that. So the first, um, not the really, well, yeah, I think the first big hit was to blame the mothers. So it's mm -hmm. all about the moms. Moms right. doesn't give enough love to the kids, that's why, or not enough education, that's why they have this weird behavior, and, and, and that's why they have problems. So it's lack of love from the mothers. It's, it's called the refrigerator hypothesis, yeah. and it was from the 70s, yeah. So that and was a lot of women suffered, and a lot of women were ostracized from society yeah. because of that. I know several cases where that happened. Yeah, 
yeah. not only here, but around the world, especially in other countries. Yeah. And, and from the 70s, it was so strong that even uh, nowadays we see women feeling guilty, but they don't know why. But it's because there is some leftover of this idea. Mm -hmm. But that's the bump. I mean, we know that's not the case. We know that there's a strong genetic component. It, uh, it, it might be a red uh, uh, ball. And it might be just as sporadic, just as spontaneous. So it's not, it's nobody's fault. So the other thing is um, vaccines. Vaccine was a big hit. And oh, my kid uh, had, was vaccinated and then suddenly he stopped talking or, or, or have these weird behaviors. Now it's all vaccines fault. So people stopped to vaccinate kids. And then we have the re-emergency of diseases that we've never seen before. And uh, that worries me a lot because some of these diseases are nasty. They, they can kill people. Um, so that's another one. And then we have, I, I would say, um, minor, uh, uh, minor problems that are, are not super uh, problematic. Um, things like, uh, yeah, autism, the, the rate of um, divorce in families uh, with a kid with autism is higher. It's, it's, it's BS. It, it's not hard to say. say, it. Yeah. say <laughs> and there's a, a couple of those uh, small things that I mean, people assume that is true. And uh, when you look at the data, it's not true. Interesting. Here's a myth that might be true. I don't know. I mean, there are some people that feel that there might be environmental um, causes, you know, the amount of pesticides, herbicides, all these things that are out there. We're beginning to measure them all the time. Of course, the current administration is making that more possible, unfortunately. Do you, do you think there might be, as with smoking or something, you know, a fairly direct thing that we will discover? Or is it really more so... Um, um, uh, multifaceted in its uh, etiology, what causes it? Or do you think there might be some, you know, bad stuff in the environment? Yeah, once we, um, uh, we removed this idea that uh, vaccines was uh, causal to autism, uh, people start looking for other, Pacific, uh, other possible environmental uh, causes. Yeah. And there is a couple of them, right? I mean, uh, uh, I... There are some that are that are definitely discarded. Uh, for example, uh, 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 if the mom is hypertense or prenatal smoking or uh, C-section, um, and these are all already discarded. There are some that might be confounded or are still inconclusive. Um, air pollution, pesticides. Uh, science doesn't have enough evidence yet to support that. And then, and then there are some uh, environmental factors that we already know that has um, uh, a strong effect on, on, on the probability to have a kid with higher chances of autism. For example, if mom during pregnancy um, uh, uh, makes use of uh, anti-convulsives, uh, there are certain uh, anti-convulsives that causes autism, such as VPA. Um, What's an anti-convulsive for people? What is it? Uh, anti-seizures. Okay. If, if mom has epilepsy, uh, that, that's a very difficult situation. If she has epilepsy and if she wants to get pregnant, if a woman has epilepsy and wants to get pregnant, she has to balance, uh, stop the medications and, 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 and have chances to have like uh, difficult seizures for nine months or not have a baby. So that's a very tough decision. And, um, and, 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 and we know now that there are some cases where a woman decided to, to move forward with that. And that correlates really well with the higher chances of having an autistic kid. So that's why VPA, the woman needs to stop or, or um, change the medication uh, if she wants to, to get pregnant. Um, uh, influenza virus uh, in the first trimester is also highly correlated with uh, having a chance uh, for, for someone with autism. A parenthesis, we don't know if uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can actually increase the chances for autism. We will only know uh, in five years from now. Wow. 
Hey, let's see. Wow, that's so much good stuff. It's unbelievable to sum it up like that. Thanks. And I guess we're coming to the end. But I, when you said the the brain, the super brain, I couldn't help but think just being from Sao Paulo, which is what, the, the, a region of 18 million or 26 million? It's like a super brain in the E.O. Wilson yeah. you know, sense, <laughs> super organism. Yeah, um, but uh, what, what's it like to be a Brazilian in America? Or are you just completely adjusted? <laughs> Uh, I, I think you never adjusted. I, I, I came already like um, uh, old as an adult. I already had like a PhD. I came from my postdoc. And uh, although I love Brazil, love Sao Paulo, uh, there are problems associated with living in a big city. I was always like um, feeling sick because so much pollution. I uh, always get infected, uh, sneezing. Uh, and when I moved to San Diego, it was um, a kind of a break in my, my health. Uh, because, I mean, the air is so much better, the quality of life, I mean, it's less stressful situation, um, not so much violence compared over there. Yeah. So there is definitely a positive aspect, and, and, and of course, I mean, I like those a lot, but uh, the culture in Brazil and, and in Sao Paulo is also very different. I mean, again, we are way more uh, social than uh, the culture here in the U.S., and that I miss a lot, um, I, that's why I love Bella Vista because they are pushing for this Latino culture. I know. <laughs> right, I just walk out the door. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because I, I I lived in Brazil for a while, but I lived in a in a part that was in the south, and um, I think my my experience if I had lived in Sao Paulo or if I lived in Rio, which I vis visited many times, it would have been completely different. Oh, yes. But yes, living in a region that was very affluent. And then going up to a city like Sao Paulo was uh, it was it was very eye opening. I had a, a few quick questions. Um, it's I know we're running out of time, and I'm I'm confident we'll come back with Brian Keating and we'll bring you on for a discussion about Nobel prizes. I also think it's going to be um, wonderful if we can bring back yourself and Katharina Jameson and Dr. Brenner and Tatiana and um, talk about the project. We didn't even get to your project with NASA. Yep. And yep. the mini brains and, and, and we've got the space station. Um, so if you could just touch briefly on that. And also, um, you know, the, the title is Great Minds in Quarantine and what it's like for you as a scientist. I, I see you're, you're at the consortium right now and you've got, we call, I call mine the glass castle and you've got your glass cube. But what is it like uh, being in quarantine as a scientist? You know, um, a lot of labs had to shut down and, and, and so are your PIs coming in? And what's that look like? So those are my yeah. kind of two questions. A little bit about NASA. Mm -hmm. uh, project, the space station, and um, and your daily life in quarantine. All right. So uh, uh, the NASA project, uh, it's very interesting. So last year, uh, we sent some brain organoids to grow uh, the space station. And the idea is to analyze how microgravity and space radiation would affect neurodevelopment. And um, so that was a very interesting um, uh, experiment. I think everybody who was involved was very excited. Uh, the data that's coming is really good. Uh, lots of uh, unusual observations. Um, and, 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 and that sparked uh, the imagination of uh, many people um, who, who knew about this and then said, wow, I mean, how, how, how can I participate? How can I contribute? So from, we start to brainstorm with other faculties uh, and Kat was uh, also very excited about that. Um, and, and, and so we decided that, uh, well, I mean, we all should work together and have not only brain tissue over there, but other things. We, right. can, we can take advantage of that environment to study cancer, liver. Um, and, and so we put like a nice proposal to NASA and uh, they, uh, it was awarded. Uh, the, uh, yeah. uh, I think there is a press release. Yeah, a yeah. press release uh, yesterday about that. So it's going to be the first it, uh, stem cell lab in space oh, and it's coming right? from here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember we were going to say brains in space. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would like to take this moment really to, to dedicate that to Dennis Sanford because I mean, from the first Thank mission, you. I thought that uh, uh, he should be uh, 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 the one uh, uh, who we should name the mission because he's a cheerleader for stem cells. He's very supportive. 
in, 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 in he is part of the creation of the collaborative consortium. So uh, we think that, um, I mean, all this, uh, it's inspired uh, by uh, his um, uh, vision on, on stem cell. He's, he's a visionary. So I, I think um, we, we own him that. We've been in contact, so we're we're working we're working to get to get him on, and Malin will be on. Malin's coming on today at five. Super, super, super. Wonderful. Yes, Denny Sanford. It, the consortium wouldn't be there if it weren't yep. for the yep. visionaries who, yep. who give their time and energy and, and resources to helping us collaborate. Yeah. So your other question: uh, yeah. How is uh, the lab adjusting to quarantine? Uh, the lab has reduced dramatically. Uh, the research, uh, I would say 90% uh, yeah, has stopped. Um, we do have uh, essential um, uh, uh, projects um, that we were able to get like approval from the university to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, this involves some animal colonies that we cannot just kill them, so we need to, to keep them alive. And some long-term brain organoids, same situation, it took like years for them to mature in a state that we cannot just discard it. Uh, it's millions of uh, dollars in research. So that was considered essential as well. So there are some members of the lab that, that comes and take care of them, but we are respecting social distance. I mean, we are, uh, uh, we are trying to be as, as clean as possible here. Um, and then, I mean, more recently, I decided to get involved and, and somehow uh, uh, offer my lab to contribute uh, to, to, uh, to study these conditions. So we're doing uh, some experiments um, here to see uh, if this virus can have any impact on the uh, nervous system. So that's what we are doing right now. Wow. Well, thank you. That's amazing. You're coming back. You're coming back. There's so much more to discuss. Sure. Yeah. Love to. <laughs> Yeah, your passion for the work is just extraordinary. As you were speaking, you know, one of the things I, I was wondering about the new generation of scientists that are coming up um, behind you guys, how are they, how do you see them as a culture? Are they different than the scientists ahead of them? What are they bringing to the conversation and to the research that's quite unique and quite, quite different? Uh-huh. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this uh, uh, generation. Uh, because at least the ones that are uh, coming to me and approaching me, um, they are very focused and they really want to make a difference. I mean, all uh, these um, the experiments that we are doing with the robot, this is the robot. I saw it, yes. Yeah. The so the robot uh, can, can move their legs yeah. using the uh, signals from the organoids. Uh, the guy who built this robot and is helping us, it's wow. a high school kid, 16 years old, <laughs> here in La Jolla. And, and he approached me, said, oh, I, I check it out your research. It's amazing. I want to be involved with it. I said, okay, what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm really good on robotics. Amazing. Wow. You know, I mean, this is a 16 years old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm meeting these kids and they are all like super impressive and, and very focused and, and, and it's a pleasure to work with them. So I have great faith on the next generation. <laughs> well, thanks for all you do. It's such a pleasure. I've seen you before, Bella Vista. Never knew what you did to the level and the depth that you do it, or with the passion that you bring to it. And the most famous line for me in all of this is that love or um, autism usually break up families. Yeah. Autism for me made me fell in love, and so I take that away, and it's it's it permeates everything you do. So yeah. Uh, yeah. it's quite extraordinary to speak with you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, guys, well, we'll see you again at five with Malin, and we're so thankful. I miss you so much, and hope we get to open our doors soon, and we all get through this safely. And man, we're gonna do some amazing things when we during it and 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 when we get out so yeah. i love you guys thanks right. for doing this amanda it's really oh. important to keep these conversations going so we i i know the world is a very difficult place now uh but uh, you are bringing joy to our community so thank you so much thank you ciao 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 Bye, ciao, ciao ciao